Hey guys, I am so excited to announce that the movie that you've been waiting for, the documentary Dr. Patient, is now available for rent or purchase at drpatientmovie.com. Check out the trailer here. When I really knew something was wrong was when I started having trouble walking up the stairs. I was supposed to be grateful and happy and healing and well and thriving, but I did not feel that way. I was so sick. Like always, I wanted to find an answer and I had to figure it out, and I had to figure it out to save my own life. So I dove in. Jill is the leading voice in biotoxin illness and chronic conditions that are driven by toxicity. Oh my gosh, you're dealing with mold? You have to work with Dr. Jill Carnahan. Dr. Jill was the first person that actually began to shed some light on the problem. What I do is listen to the patient and we together talk about what else is possible. I don't know why I'm crying. <laughs> she saved my life. The deepest lessons and most profound insights come in the suffering, come in the dark moments. Self-compassion is the healing transition that, that shifts something inside of us. It's actually the thing that we need most in order to heal. Dr. Patient. Available now at DrPatientMovie.com. Welcome to Resiliency Radio, your go-to podcast for the most cutting-edge insights in integrative and functional medicine. I'm your host, Dr. Jill, and join us as each week we dive into the heart of healing and personal transformation. We're going to lead with the best leading experts and researchers in the world of functional integrative medicine and empowering you with knowledge and inspiration to empower you on your healing journey. Today, I am so excited to be here with a colleague and friend and someone who I just respect so deeply in the industry, um, Bree, aka Coach Betty Rocker. Um, she is a forward-thinking, women-specific coach and personal trainer who takes a holistic approach to building a strong, fit body you love. She provides life stage-specific guidance, whether you're still in your cycling years, in perimenopause, or pe postmenopausal. Her goal is to empower you with the skills and knowledge you need to make the best choices for yourself inside and out, so you can love the person you are, achieve the results you're looking for, and enjoy yourself along the way. Welcome, Bree, to the show. Hello. Thanks for having me. It's great to be with you. Yeah, it's always fun. Like even before we get on, we could talk for like a half hour and I'm like, okay, let's start the show. But it's so fun to connect. And I'm especially excited because you've been working on a program which is out when this is released. Um, and it's all about speaking to these women in the different specific stages of life. And I'd love for you to just kind of frame us with what this program, who is this for? Uh, because I think a lot of our listeners are going to relate. Well, if you're in perimenopause, thanks for that, by the way. Um, like I'm, I'm personally in perimenopause right now, as you know, as you've been serving me in the capacity of, as my doctor, which I so appreciate as well as being my friend, but going through perimenopause has been challenging at the start. It was very challenging. And what was really interesting is I wanted to create a program that served women at my age, once I got to the other side of the frustration and all of the challenges that this time in our, this transition time in our lives really brings. I feel like I used to really have like this negative sort of association with the word menopause. And then once I got to this stage where I'm almost there, I was like, oh, wow, I feel like I just need to learn new stuff. I need to learn. I didn't get a manual for how my body works when I was born. So I got to like put that together, not only for myself, but then for these women who I serve and who are walking on this journey with me. And fortunately, this coincided with a time in history where we're suddenly getting more research on women specifically. You know, we're not small men, as our good friend Stacey Sims always says. Yeah. And there's a lot more science and a lot more research for women. And as a result of that, we're getting better ideas about how to navigate these, these transition years, for instance, and then post-menopause as well. So I put together a new program called PerimenoFit, which takes you on a journey for eight weeks, and it sets you up with the training strategies, the nutrition strategies, as well as the lifestyle strategies that really do make a difference to you in perimenopause in these transition years. Because 
over the last five or so years since I've been in perimenopause, I've gone from being like, you know, bloated and, and feeling a little bit like I was gaining weight, even though I'm a trainer and had all these things dialed in to now being like lean and shredded and, and just feeling amazing and, and having great energy and knowing how to navigate things as I go. And that feels very empowering. And so I, I put all of that into this new program, but I also wanted to serve all of my women in every life stage. So before I released Perimenofit, I actually went through every past program that I've created because I have some great programs. And I added custom options for women in perimenopause and postmenopause. Because when I created those programs, of course, I was in my cycling years, right? I hadn't learned all this yet. And once I learned, I wanted to provide those resources so that any woman who does any of my fitness programs now has access to custom tracks custom guidance. All of that is now accessible in the whole Betty Rocky verse, basically. So I, I appreciate you asking. I know that was a very long answer, but I just, I appreciate the opportunity to learn and then to serve just like you. I love that. And I love that you frame that. And it's interesting about your story and mine as well. Um, most people don't know that their doctors are not trained for menopause. I have a couple ob um colleagues and they literally do maybe a you know, um, weekend eight hour course or something very, very small, maybe less than that, maybe even just a couple of hour lectures on what to do in menopause and actually help women. And I will also frame this in since 2001, which was actually the year I graduated from medical school, there was this massive fear around hormones and menopause and what do we do with this? And so there was a lot of, there's been a lot of ignorance and I'm just going to frame that because as we talk, if you're talking to your doctor and they're not menopause aware, or you're talking to a coach and they're not, it really is a big deal. And the framework is that as you and I have gone through this, and this is what I'm seeing in my colleagues who are maybe in medicine and they're actually going through it, all of a sudden there's this new aha, right? When we experience something, it's like for me, for sure. And I went through premature ovarian failure after chemotherapy in my 20s. So I actually went through like a mini menopause for two years and then multiple different things. And so I actually went through... Um, complete menopause. Menopause is a day, you know, when you actually stop your period. And then after that is post, I'm postmenopausal. And I really, even though I've been through breast cancer, I know hormones, I help women deal with their hormones. I don't think I understand, stood the depth of information. And like you said, what's exciting is so many of our colleagues are coming out with books and information that's really, really helpful and science-based for women, whether you're on the verge, perimenopausal, whether you're um, in that last period and then beyond for postmenopause. So I'm so excited to talk to you about that as far as what women do, because I think a lot of women out there are getting mixed messages. Many women, at least in the last 20 years, go to their doctor, talk about the symptoms, which I might just outline and then let you go with it. Um, and they talk about these symptoms. And again, I'm going to give you guys a list. So if you're out there like, is this me? What's going on? Um, and their doctor says, well, you might just be depressed. Your labs are normal. And that makes me so mad, right? Because it's way, way, way more than a mood disorder. It has really, it does affect our moods, but it, this is a hormonal transition that we all go through. And now as we're living longer, we get to spend sometimes 20, 30 years postmenopausal. So this is really, really critical. So anyway, thank you for creating a program. Thank you for coming on the show to talk about this because I think women are so hungry for more information. I couldn't agree more. And I, I think to, you know, to your point about their doctors, and I, I want to first just thank all the doctors out there for all the things that they have learned to this point. Like, just like me, like I was sharing that I, I realized what I didn't know when I got to that point and I wanted to learn it. I feel that most every doctor I've ever met got into medicine because they wanted to help take care of people and save lives and help people. And so I just want to say, I think that they're also eager to learn and to, to, to help women more, but they just don't know what they don't know. If, if they had had that presented to them in medical school, they would. So I think we really have a lot of opportunity to help elevate the medical profession at this stage of history. And that's only going to help women. This is a time in history where we really need to help women. Like it's really important. It's always been important, but it's very important now. <laughs> especially. Um, so I'm, I'm excited and hopeful to see changes happening in that arena. Um, and, and I, because I've too, Jill have heard so many of my, uh, 
customers tell me they've been dismissed for their health concerns. You know, we were, we were, you were going to go through the list of some of the symptoms someone starts to have. Do you want to maybe take it? Yeah, let's do that. Cause that'll frame some yeah. of you out there listening, like, oh, is this me? Where am I at? Right. Um, and I'll just frame really quickly. What happens is this perimenopausally, it's usually like anywhere from 35 to 45 years old. It can be even a little longer. Average age of me uh, menopause is 51. So between 45 and 55 is a pretty good sphere. So if you're like 40 to 45, like I was, and you actually stop having periods, that's actually considered premature menopause. But these are, if you're out there and you're 35 to 55, it's probably worth speaking to you because you're somewhere in this range. Before you stop having periods, what happens is usually your progesterone starts to putter out. And so you actually have some estrogen dominance, which means you might be moody or heavier, painful periods or breast tenderness or all these kinds of things, maybe even breakouts. And then all of a sudden you start to slow down. And at some point you stop having a period. And once you've been 12 months without a period, that's considered you're officially, you've hit menopause and now you're postmenopausal. So that's kind of definition. And then let's just frame symptoms because I think the people will relate to these. I use a symptom score sheet and because I think that's actually more accurate than labs. And some of the symptoms are hot flashes, lightheaded or dizziness, headaches, irritability, feeling down or depressed or lack of motivation, um, anxiety, mood changes, uh, restlessness at night or insomnia, backache, joint pain, new tendonitis, shoulder aches, those kinds of things, muscle pain, new facial hair. All of a sudden you're like, where did those chin hairs come from? Um, dry skin, uh, loss of sexual libido or loss of sexual interest, um, uncomfortable intercourse, vaginal dryness, and urinary frequency. And those are just the big ones. <laughs> so I'll let you take it from here, Bree. So you see these women, what are you seeing their needs and, and talk about your program as far as it, I'm sure you address diet lifestyle. Where do people go in this range of things when they're, and maybe we can frame it as far as the premenopausal and then the postmenopausal as well. Yeah, and I'm glad you went through that that list because when you listen and you hear those symptoms of, as Dr. Jill was going through them, any one of those alone, like as you were first saying them, I was like, gosh, some of those sound like PMS. Some of those sound, you know, like they could be a, a variety of, they could be coming from a variety of different things. So it's often hard to pinpoint this is perimenopause or I'm just starting to have this. And if you're on the pill, you may not notice some of the symptoms as quickly, of course, because the pill's going to suppress your own natural hormone response. So you don't maybe notice the dip as your hormones start to decline. And you mentioned loss of libido. Um, and, and one of the things we were talking about is how your progesterone declines. Well, your estrogen levels also are declining and you can still have estrogen dominance, even as both of these hormone levels are declining, which is crazy, but it yes. happens and your testosterone levels are also declining. And these three hormones together are really powerful for us as women, you know, and especially we've got three different types of estrogen. And the one that we start to lose that's significant for our body composition specifically is the E2 or the est estradiol. Do we say, do I say estrid, I say estradiol, right? Not est exactly. Estrid yeah. Okay. Sometimes I'm not sure of my pronunciation, but that estradiol is really important for our anabolic response, our ability to repair and recover our muscle tissue. And one of the things a lot of women start to notice that they come to me for is they start to notice they're gaining weight. And that's the main thing I'm gaining weight. Right. And they're not maybe defining it as I'm losing my muscle and gaining body fat, which is how I define it. Because of course, the more lean mass we have on our body, the more metabolically active we are. That means the more calories we burn at rest, right? There's a lot of benefits to muscle and having muscle on your body. And this doesn't mean you're a bodybuilder. This just means you have, you, your body has all of these skeletal, skeletal muscle all around your bones. It provides you with support and structure, strength. And we want to pay attention to the health of that tissue, strengthen and repair it the way we eat and all the ways that we live but it's not something to be afraid of, right? And so, yeah. but the problem is as we hit perimenopause is we we sort of start to lose it because we, our, our E2 estrogen starts to go down. And then it is compounded by the loss of our progesterone and progesterone actually serves as a bit of a buffer to your cortisol, which as you start to feel more anxious, you start to feel more stressed. And as cortisol rises with no buffer to protect you against its impact, you're more likely to store more body fat and cortisol also will break down your muscle tissue. So there are these compounding sort of things happening. Plus, as your testosterone goes down, testosterone impacts your libido, but it also impacts your, your bone mass, your muscle mass. So 
these are all of, these are just like a few little things that are impacted by the hormone imbalance that begins to happen. And it's not always like, it's, you can think of it like a car starting to sputter. Would you say that's a good analogy, Jill? Like, yes, I always say it's like the end of the Heinz ketchup. You're like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Cause it's not like it's all like at once. <laughs> it's not all at once. It's not like, oh, my period, like, cause you, you almost don't notice when your period starts to slow down. You might not, not yeah. every, every woman is different. Women from different cultural backgrounds also experience perimenopause a little bit differently. Sometimes it's longer, it lasts longer. You were saying, Dr. Jill, that it can span, like there's like this 15 to 20 year span that it could be in, right? It could start early, it could start later. Mine started in my early forties. Um, I asked my mom when she hit menopause and she was like the average, like she was like 52, I think. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, probably maybe that'll be where I am too, but it's also impacted by my lifestyle, my, a lot of other things as well. So I just think it's all just so interesting. And because women don't actually know that much about their hormones, they, we just take it for granted until something is, goes wrong usually because, you know, we're just functioning. We're just trying to get through the day. We're not trying to think about our hormones until we have an issue. And I guess I just come back to the symptoms you, you sort of listed for us because you won't experience all of those symptoms all yeah. at once because perimenopause and approaching menopause doesn't happen very at once and it doesn't happen sequentially, right? Yeah. There's sort of just this sort of compounding situation. Yep. Hey everybody. I just stopped by to let you know that my new book, Unexpected, Finding Resilience Through Functional Medicine, Science and Faith is now available for order wherever you purchase books. In this book, I share my own journey of overcoming life-threatening illness and the tools and tips and tricks and hope and resilience I found along the way. This book includes practical advice for things like cancer and Crohn's disease and other autoimmune conditions, infections like Lyme or Epstein-Barr and mold and biotoxin related illness. What I really hope is that as you read this book, you find transformational wisdom for health and healing. If you want to get your own copy, stop by readunexpected.com. There you can also collect your free bonuses. So grab your copy today and begin your own transformational journey through functional medicine in finding resilience. One day you can have that spurt, like you said, the car or sputtering or the Heinz yeah. catch of estrogen and all of a sudden you have breast turnus and, and maybe that cycle yeah. study. And you can have over, excuse me, <clears throat> your ovaries go back and forth with um, uh, ovulation and you have this irregular ovulation, sometimes lack of ovulation during perimenopause, mm -hmm. but often you'll even notice every other month you have kind of different cycles, like the right side ovary does one thing and the left does another. So I've had a lot of women talk about that too. So what do women do? Because um, I love the way you talked about those hormones too. And I want to talk real briefly before I, what do women do? Um, because I think of it as all of a sudden as the estrogen progesterone drop, and you mentioned insulin and cortisol. Insulin's going to cause visceral fat around organs yep. and insulin will cause metabolic dysfunction. So all of a sudden women will say my blood sugar is more high or my yeah. intolerance to carbs is worse or all those things related to higher insulin, which is like the precursor of diabetes, diabetic metabolic stuff. And then the cortisol, which stores fat on our body. And when you have estrogen, progesterone drop, cortisol, insulin go up, of course, you're going to gain some weight or feel like you're puffy around the middle. What yep. do women do? Let's talk about the actual how to with these hormones because it's almost inevitable, but we can make changes that will modulate that, right? Absolutely, we can. And I'm glad you brought up the insulin because I didn't mention it before, but it's always on my mind because as we, as our estrogen declines, we are we do struggle a little bit more to regulate our insulin. Um, one thing that you can do today, or like any day this week after you listen to this, walk after a meal. This is one of the fastest ways to help reduce your blood sugar response. Uh, and this is also great for your digestive function. And um, just walking more in general is kind of one of the secrets to fat loss in perimenopause. It's like you always knew that walking was good for you, but it's as we start to get into this life stage and also later past menopause, that this becomes one of the dials that you can turn to really improve increase your body's ability to burn body fat because residual movement, the movement that you do throughout the day accounts for about 15% of your total daily energy burn. You, you Only 5% comes from your workout. 
You know, mm -hmm. you've got like 70% of your daily energy burn comes from just your resting metabolic rate. And that's impacted by how much lean muscle you have. You'll burn more calories at rest if you have more lean muscle. So there's another plug for getting stronger, which we'll talk about in a bit. But um, then another 10% comes from just you digesting your food, the thermic effect of food. And you can make that go up by eating more protein because protein takes more energy to digest, to break down the nutrient absorption of protein. I'm not saying you need to eat just protein, but you need to make sure it's an important part of your meals, every meal that you eat. So you've got back to my main point, which is you are burning a certain amount of energy just by existing your basal metabolic rate. You're burning some energy by when you're eating your food, you're burning 5% of your energy with your workout. So there's this other like 15% accounted for by how much you move throughout the day. And a lot of us at this life stage are actually more sedentary than we've ever been, which kind of coincides, unfortunately, with the drop in our hormones. So if you would just walk more, if you would make walking one of your like non-negotiable priorities daily, it doesn't have to be after every single meal, it could just be like you always walk after dinner or you always walk after breakfast and then you try to walk more throughout the day you'll see a real impact on your body's ability to lose body fat. I got a walking pad last year, uh, which had a huge impact. Have you seen, you've probably seen my videos of me walking on my little walking pad, but I just like, it only goes four miles an hour tops. It's just, I just walk on it after I work from home. So I'll walk on it after lunch for 10 minutes. Yeah. And at night, if I'm watching a show, I'll walk on it during the show. Cause it just gives me that much more time that I'm not just sitting on my butt, you know, like I That's work at a great computer. hack. It's just a simple, in fact, our office got excited about walking. So we have one of those really simple walking treadmills that can go move around. So all the staff shares that they just <laughs> rotated. Good. So yeah, I think it's a great, great idea. Yeah. My, mine's really light and portable and I move it. I'll move it. To, sometimes I'll record a podcast while I'm walking yeah. slowly on it, you know, but there's so much evidence about walking, especially for women. Um, there's so many, there's so much evidence that nearly all causes of cancer are mm -hmm. reduced by walking more. Um, women post-menopause, there are a lot of studies on women post-menopause who get tremendous benefit from walking for improving their bone density, which is something that we yeah. really want to think about as we age, because that loss of those hormones, um, it means a lot of us are not we're not doing all the things that we could be doing to preserve our muscle mass. And some of the benefit of working towards preserving muscle mass also helps preserve your bone density. So low impact walking is just so amazing. It preserves your muscle. It helps strengthen your bones. And then you can do other things as well, but just walking has this tremendous impact on us. So that's just one thing that I would say. I love that, Brie, because that's so accessible for any woman, almost no matter yeah. what your weight or, or your stage of life or even disability wise, usually people can hopefully have that mobility. Um, and I think it's so, so crucial. It's been one of my favorite times a day. And sometimes it's late because I tell I get done is 930, but I love the moonlight walks. I take one every night before my Epsom salt bath. <laughs> so, that's great. Yeah. That's great. And you can, um, if you want to like add a, I know a lot of you out there are overachievers like me. You're like, Okay, well, if I can do what that, else? what else can I do? Yeah. So you could add, you could wear a weighted vest when you walk oh, to excellent. help distribute the load of weight on you, and and only do this if when you're walking it's pain free. You don't have yeah. joint pain when you're walking. But um, I would say that that's just a really easy way to add a little bit of extra resistance to your walk, right. and um, that would help you if you're if you're like I really want to use this for weight loss purposes or fat loss purposes. That's a great bonus hack that you could add. Um, to your, to your walking routine. And then there let's are other talk about, yeah, let's talk about what else you could do if you want to do, do. Yeah. Yeah. And frame it as far as the perimenopause and menopause, maybe okay. a couple of options. Well, when you're in your cycling years, you know, you've got your highest levels of, of circulating hormones that you're ever going to have. And you have almost a natural advantage though. You don't realize it. Right. So if, if sometimes if you're, if you're in my life stage or Dr. Jill's life stage, you're like, Oh, if only I'd known this back then, because these strategies that I'm going to share with you they could have worked for you really well in your cycling years too. So if you're listening to this and you're like, oh, this isn't for me, this is for you too, because balance, creating balance in your workout routine can benefit you at any time in your life. You just have more resilience when you're younger and you have more robust hormone function, right? So when we get into perimenopause, we want to start thinking about recovery and how we're polarizing the volume of our training with the recovery that we're doing. And you could have thought about this in your cycling years too, but if you didn't, you got away with it. So this is, this is the time to really start to care about this and dial it in. So when I say volume, 
what's high volume for you listening right now where you're at? That might be you are working against gravity and your own body, and that's challenging for you. And that's a great way to build a strong foundation and a base of strength in your body. You maybe have been doing body weight training for a while, or you're training from home and you're already using some weighted objects. This is the time to start to get a little more specific with the amount of resistance that you're using and really start to challenge yourself against a load. Um, if you're experienced using your, your home dumbbells or your home workout equipment, and you're kind of using very light weights and going through like, like 20 reps in a workout circuit. This is when I want you to start thinking about really upping the challenge for yourself and working against a load because your, your muscles are going to adapt to the load that you provide them with. And, and, and if you challenge them enough, they will respond by, they break down when you're doing your workout and then you rebuild and repair them as, as you're resting and recovering and also refueling and the other pieces that are important. But it's this sort of polarization between a high volume training and then the appropriate amount of recovery that's so important. Now, other aspects of high volume training that matter for us are high intensity interval training. We can also, we can think of sprints. We can think of um, things like Tabatas, box jumps, um, plyometric type exercises, all of that type of speed or burst or explosive cardio is all the same thing. It's all in the same category that really loads your joints, strengthens your muscles and your bones, and is really powerful and effective for you. What we want to step away from is the long, extensive cardio sessions, right? These are the types of things that can burn you out a bit. And we hear it's very buzzy right now for people to say, oh, don't do cardio because it elevates your cortisol and that's all bad. And I'm like, no, you want, cardio has a very important place in our workouts. What we don't want to do is too much cardio. Yeah. We want to do strategic cardio. And it that's what we're talking about, explosive cardio. So it's resistance training against a load that's effective and challenging for you and explosive cardio. And then if you're already comfortable using your dumbbells and you're like trying to do deadlifts or squats and you're little dumbbells aren't really making it so that you, you have to stop at like 12 reps or eight reps or six reps. You may want to start going up to more heavyweight, like barbells and those types of things. Like you want to gradually build yourself up. You don't want to go from zero to the highest level just because someone told you to lift heavy, you know, lift heavy for you, build your strength. You've got years to build this up. It, it took me years of training to build my own strength. And I'm so grateful I did because I got to this life stage and I already had a base. And so I'm building from there. You want to build where you're at so that you can stay safe and injury free, right? And then there's even more specificity that you can get into. Once you're working in an, say an eight to 12 rep range and you're comfortable there, that's when you want to start challenging yourself to maybe go a little heavier and get your rep range lower. Maybe it's a six to eight rep range. Maybe you're doing four to six reps. And this applies to you post-menopause as well. It, it applies, but it's it's almost like even more mm -hmm. essential for you to be training a, with high volume and then recovering. And that doesn't mean it's every other day training, although that's a very effective way to train. It could be that you're pairing uh, low impact strength training with a high explosive cardio workout day two, and then you're taking a recovery day, Good. right? It, it doesn't have to be like one and then rest, but it can be. Those are all just different ways that you could explore that type of polarization in your training. The point is focus on resistance training and explosive cardio as two of the important pieces of your training that are going to help you the most to strengthen your muscle tissue. But muscle doesn't grow when you are training it. It grows when you rest it. And this is what's so important to understand because as our, that E2 estradiol that we were talking about, that estrogen starts to taper off and then postmenopausal, it drops off. We have to look, use these other pathways that our body has for building muscle because we don't have the same level of resilience to bounce back from a workout quickly after we train. We create an inflammatory response in the body with our workouts. The body needs more time to recover and come back strong after you've trained. Does that all make sense? That is spectacular. And a couple of questions, cause I can hear people asking number one, 
I have a lot of people who listen who have chronic infection or long COVID or some kind of serious chronic issues, and they might be struggling to, you know, just get out of bed. Um, I love the idea of the walking, but I want to speak to one thing in particular, and this is what we see as post-exercise fatigue, where people who work out too much or too intense, mm. they'll have like a day or two where they literally, I would say, did you pay for that workout? And not in a good recovery way. I'm talking like they can barely get out of bed. What about, I feel like there's so much evidence for conditioning in these situations, POTS, dysautonomia, kind of the chronic stuff. And I know more, your population is more healthy, all ranges, but what would you say to that person out there who's like, ah, but Jill and Bree, I can't hardly do this. How could they start or get some semblance of success um, with this kind of maybe more of a, um, a difficult situation like that? That's really good. That's a good question. Cause there is actually a third component to this training sort of strategy structure that I create for people in my training programs. Um, it's the self-care and and mm -hmm. the active self-care piece. This is a hugely important component, especially as we're aging and we're losing things like collagen and elastin mm -hmm. and the flexibility in our healthy tissue, right? It's not just about your workouts. We've got to talk about the recovery. And this is a, this is a way in for people who may be struggling Perfect. as well, because working on mobility and your joint, the, the range of motion in your joint is what a mobility means flexibility is the stretch factor of your muscle tissue. So between the two, you want to work on both and things. This is why things like yoga are fantastic. Things like Pilates. A lot of people really enjoy Pilates and don't get into it until they're in their forties and just swear by it. And that's because they haven't ever really had a chance to work their body against that type of resistance that is also increasing the range of motion around their joints. So it's improving their mobility. It's improving their, their flexibility, their tissue yeah. health. But remember a lot of us have the tendency to always think more is going to be more, right. more workouts are going to give me more results. And this is what will kind of burn you out because like we were talking about exercise creates this inflammatory response. So you need to really have thoughtful programming, whatever level you're starting at, you have to be very thoughtful about your own body's recovery time that it needs. I tend to train three to four days a week max at high volume. And then I'm taking active recovery days the rest of the time. I'm either doing yoga or a mobility thing, or I'm walking, right? I'm always walking, yes. but you know, I'm, I'm not sitting around a rest day. Doesn't mean I'm a couch potato. Right. And I don't recommend that for anyone, but, uh, I do think that that type of, of work, that type of, it's very much body weight in yes. nature, but it's, it's really, that's why I say just because you hear us talk about high volume training, what's high volume for you right yes. now, you know, and also is high volume training even appropriate for you? Like, is if you're in, if you're dealing with an autoimmune condition, you may want to talk to your doctor before you get into some kind of like high volume training situation where you can set yourself back without meaning to. I think we all have to take this information on an individual yeah. basis, right? But I love that because you've given such a good um, anywhere from daily. First of all, the daily walking, as long as you're able to move, to me, that is a core. And I recommend it to literally 100% of my patients, as long as they're mobile and they have strength in their legs. And if they don't, well, let's work up to that so that you can, because that is just such a key. I couldn't agree more. And then from there, you can pick and choose. And my thought is the data supports that even those who are having severe post-exertional fatigue, there are protocols that are conditioning, right? So they start small and you might work with a yes. trainer or get your doctor or a coach or whatever else. So even then there's no excuse for not moving, but I like your idea of recovery. Give us an example. You mentioned what you do, but give us maybe one or two examples of what would like a calendar look like for someone who's trying to find balance, say the average uh, post-menopausal woman who sure. wants to maintain muscle. What, what would that look like for her weekly like planner? Sure. Um, I would give her probably, I'd start her out with a Monday, Wednesday, Friday split training split of her workouts. And, um, let's say Monday was like a lower body focused day. We're going to focus on lower body strength. And we're also going to build in some plyometrics that day. And we're going to take a recovery day on the second day, but we're going to do some mobility work that day. Right. Wednesday, we're going to do an upper body focused day. And we're also going to have some plyo built into that day. So you're going to have some resistance training and some plyometrics together on that day. And then Thursday, you are going to do some um, breathing. You're going to sit down and you're going to do some actual like stress reduction on purpose. 
that's either going to be like maybe alternate nostril breathing, which has great um, research and health benefits, or it's going to be box breathing, or you're going to do an activity like that intentionally. And you could do that any day, but like if you start building that into your your week, at least once a week, the way that you you see it, like this is just as important as my workout because it's going to help build my stress resilience. This is going to help lower my cortisol levels. And it's just going to, I'm going to feel so good from doing it. Maybe I'll do it on other days too. Right. But you got to have pick a day and add that in. If you're not doing that yet, okay. we got to start somewhere. Then Friday, maybe you'll do a full body workout, right. With some plyo built in, or you could do a low impact strength training, full body workout on Friday. And then on Saturday, you could do a high intensity interval training plyo workout if you wanted to space them out or you could do them all on Friday. It really depends on how busy you are. I find a lot of people, a lot of women, especially postmenopausal, they want to go be active on the weekends. They want to go hiking or they want to go kayaking, especially in the summertime. They've got a lot of stuff to do. So it might be nice to get your workouts done in that three-day split. And is that enough? Yes, it's absolutely enough, especially when you make these workouts really effective for you, right? You don't want to be just going through the motions in your workouts. You don't, this is also why we don't want to train every day because you stay in this gray zone all the time and you're constantly in an inflamed state. You never fully recover. You can never really lose the body fat. This is why a lot of women are like, I'm training five or six days a week and I'm just not seeing the weight come off. And I'm like, you're stuck, you yeah. know, like your, your body can't sustain that level of activity and also go through all of its important processes internally. And especially without those hormones there to support you. So this is what I'm saying. We have to use these alternate pathways that the body has to build strength. Had I used that type of training program, and I actually wrote that type of training into a lot of my earlier workout programs because it's just a fantastic and balanced way to train. Um, it's not unique to you in perimenopause or postmenopause, but it becomes essential to care about that style of training at that life stage and both of those life stages. You could start that style of training in perimenopause. It's exactly what I recommend. It's not that you need to do two different things in perimenopause and postmenopause when it comes to your training. You just want to set yourself up for success in perimenopause by stopping the overtraining, stopping the endless cardio. You know, your hormones are starting to decline. This is a great opportunity for you to start to build more strength in a smart way, train more strategically and set yourself up for postmenopause. And if you didn't know this and you are in postmenopause, well, this is a great time to start doing this as well. It's never too late to, to do this. It's awesome. Um, Trying to think what else. So I told you about your weekend. Just make sure you get some yoga in over the weekend. Do a little more self-care. Maybe get on your foam roller at some point, maybe Sunday before the busy week starts again. Maybe you do another five minutes of breathing activity a couple days, you know, just that's a week for me, basically. <laughs> it's three or four days, just mm -hmm. like I outlined for you. And I might do three days of full body weight training, like three days of body, three days of full body training instead mm -hmm. of like splitting up the body sure. parts, but that's all good. Like yeah. You know, that's why I write these programs. So, so that you have the balance from a trainer who is giving you really good splits. Um, and the, the eating component is so important too, Dr. Jill, of course, as we know. It's like yeah. Let's shift to that before we do two things come up. Cause again, I'm hearing people ask that, that are, I think relevant one is intuition. You and I are so, um, on, on exact same frequency on this in that your body, especially as a woman, and especially as a perimenopausal or postmenopausal woman knows, it knows it has innate wisdom. I'd love to hear your thoughts, but I just wanted to say, I think that there's a piece of this that say you have this plan Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and all of a sudden Friday comes and you're like, I am so tired. I don't feel well today. And your mind is telling you, the judge is like, but you should, but you must, but you told someone you were going to do this program. I love, I want to talk about where is that line between, because our bodies know, right? right? And I want to give women out there that permission because I've done it a million times where like today doesn't feel right. But then tomorrow when I wasn't planning, I do something I wasn't planning. So intuition. And yep. then after that, well, let's talk that first. But, but that's intuition. just such a great segue because this is yeah. the, this is the thing. When you're in perimenopause, you're still having a cycle. And that means you're still going to have a luteal phase and a follicular phase, right? Mm -hmm. Follicular phase, just in case you're listening to this and you're like, what are, what does that mean? The follicular phase is from when you get your period until you ovulate. That's the first half of your cycle. And our estrogen is typically higher in that phase, which means we can push harder in our workouts. We have more energy and drive. Then after we ovulate till when we get our period again, this is the luteal phase. And this is when progesterone jumps up mm -hmm. and progesterone does so many important things for our bodies. And one of, but one of the things it does is it elevates our basal body temperature just a bit as we're, the body's preparing for potential, you know, 
the, the stimulation of the egg, right? So get fertilization of the egg. So that elevation in our basal body temperature is one of the reasons that we don't get as good and deep of sleep in that second half of our cycle. And this gets a little bit like our inflammatory response is a little bit heightened in that second phase. So like, this is why you like in perimenopause, you feel those PMS symptoms that Dr. Jill was outlining even stronger, especially I would think in the luteal phase is when you're going to feel those. And it's sort of unpredictable in perimenopause because you don't always know when you're going to get your period because it starts yes. to change, right? It gets erratic. So it yeah. becomes like, you're like, I constantly have PMS. Like what the heck? Yes, exactly. Yeah, exactly. It's really frustrating. So back to the, the main, like, point that yeah. we're talking about here is it's like, what do you do if you feel like you, you feel less energy one day because you're going to, your energy levels aren't as high in the luteal phase as they are in the follicular phase, which is what I'm talking about here. And that's true in perimenopause as well. So you, you absolutely back off when you don't feel like that. You don't do your body any favors by pushing yourself when you are in an inflamed state or you are tired. And we, we often expect our progress to be linear. You're like, well, last week I lifted this much weight and did this many reps. And so this come next week, I need to do more. No, your body, you got to allow your body to sort of tell you how hard to push it. Because say you're postmenopausal, this like cycling thing with the luteal and follicular phase doesn't apply to you, but you might have a poor night's sleep. You mm -hmm. might be going through a high stress time. You may just need to back off for whatever reason. Maybe you went for an amazing hike yesterday and it kind of wore you out more than you realized you back off, yeah. you know, listen, trust yourself, listen to your body and don't force it, right? You're going to get a far better result by going high volume on the days you have the energy to go high volume. Yeah. That's it. Like your body's going to respond better. And then you're going to fuel appropriately. Thanks for sharing that. Cause I think that's important to give women permission. Cause so many of us are, you know, driven or, or you're successful in your life or your relationships. And in this, you want to be successful, but I think part of the healing is actually really giving yourself permission to take care of yourself first. Yes. And that's what we're Julie, both doing. hundred <laughs> percent. That's why I always say it's all or something, not all yeah. or nothing. Love we, it. Yes. We, I remember <laughs> so, we come from that mentality uh, that more is more like I was yeah. talking about before. Yeah. It's not. It's right. not, it's absolutely not. It, and, and you may, you may get rewarded for doing more is more in a lot of other areas of your life, like work, you get ahead if you work harder, right? right. You get, you get, you get a lot of rewards. And so you think that that applies even to your body, but your body needs to be respected and honored and you deserve to have the self-care built in. And yes, yes, yes. And thank you for sharing. So that's the, if you're pushing too hard, where do you listen to that? But on this other side, one of the symptoms of low estrogen is the typical drive and motivation that women are used to in their perimenopausal years and even up into 20s, 30s, and up into 40s often wanes. I've seen so many women all of a sudden who are driven CEOs or you name it. And all of a sudden they're like, I feel less motivated. I feel less driven. What is wrong with me? Now, first of all, there's nothing wrong with you because we go from this like analytical um, uh, in. Arthur Brooks wrote in Strength to Strength how we really transition to a wise person, a wise woman, and we use our resources differently. But in the sense of a workout or a goal or wanting to lose weight, what do we do when we lack motivation? Coach Betty Rocker <laughs> to the rescue, right? Tell us yeah, about, often, what would you recommend for people who are just struggling? Like, I want to do this so bad, but I'm lacking motivation. Any tips or tricks on like just motivational kind of behavioral stuff? Yeah. I don't always think it's really motivation that you need. Sometimes I think it's that you just need to be kind to yourself and like, see if you're burned out. Like right now, maybe you are also in a season of your life where other things are a priority. I find a lot of women in their late forties, early fifties, they're, they've become the caretaker of an aging parent mm -hmm. or they're dealing with another type of really big life thing. Like they have to, they have to deal yeah. with stuff that is big, big life stuff. You're in a season of life where your energy is so caught up in something else. It's not that you're lacking the motivation. It's just that you're spread too thin. You don't need to make this like the number one priority of your life in the same way that maybe you used to would have. Yeah, I think it's just about, it's not, it's not always about motivation, I guess is my yeah. point. And then sometimes you're bored. You're bored and that's what's giving you that lack of motivation. You need something new. You need new information. You need something to light you up and make you feel excited again. And I think a lot of that comes down to education and feeling empowered to understand what's happening in your body. So I would look at those types of things before I would say, you're not motivated. You know, I would say, 
maybe you're burned out. Maybe you need some, maybe you are busy with something else in your life and you need to just take care of that first. Let that be the priority for now. Do mm -hmm. what you can in the meantime, walk if you can, yeah. but don't feel like you have to force yourself to like do all this extra stuff. Like, so that's a perfect answer because that's that kindness and self-compassion, which is really the ultimate healer. So in our last few minutes, there's a lot of things you mentioned protein, um, yep. but people are like, what do we do with our diet? And why is I know. it, uh, there, I know. There, there are some things I think we need to think more about and especially post-menopause, what kinds of yeah. recommendations would you make for diet, frequency of meals, fasting, some of the basics? Just in a nutshell, I think gut health becomes a hugely important thing to pay attention to as we age, you know, we're, we're losing our, some of our collagen. We're not producing our collagen as easily, right? And those epithelial cells that line our gut that help protect the gut lining and help us with nutrient absorption, as well as um, the estrobolome and the, the ability for our body to process estrogen out. Like this is one of the causes of estrogen dominance, as we know, is that when we get a gut dysbiosis or we get an overgrowth of bacteria or the gut microbiome isn't balanced because we're eating too much processed foods or sugar, or we're drinking too much alcohol, or there's all these myriad of reasons why our gut can get off balance. But that causes this problem where our body can't process the excess estrogen out. And so we, it gets, comes back into our body as a sort of dirty estrogen and it causes this estrogen dominance. And this is more like perimenopausal that that specifically happens, but gut, gut imbalance and that kind of stuff can disrupt you at any stage of life. And I would say that our gut health becomes really paramount to make a priority to pay attention to. So get back to basics. If this is something that you think, uh, maybe I need to clean it up a little bit. This was me. Actually, I, I do all of my programs are gluten-free and dairy-free because I'm trying to help people reset their system quite frequently. They just need a little reset, but there are other foods besides gluten and dairy that can be triggers for people like eggs, nightshades, there are so many different foods that this is why elimination diets are a thing, right? Sometimes you need to go through a protocol to help clear things out for a period of time and then slowly reintroduce them back in. But it was really amazing. I got really specific again about um, cutting out gluten and dairy. I took out eggs. I took out a bunch of things and my a lot of things cleared up for me. A lot of things were a lot easier as a result of that. And um, along with the fiber that you need to support good gut health. Um, that's a huge component of this conversation is just more fiber in general, if we're not yes. paying attention to it, is that your protein needs do change. You don't absorb the amino acids from the protein you eat quite as readily as you age. And so you need just a little bit more to do the same amount as before. And a lot of women I find weren't eating enough protein to start with. So this seems like this huge deal. Like, oh my gosh, you're asking me to eat so much protein. I'm like, I'm really not. I'm asking you to make it about like 25 to 35% of your plate every day. Like, and that's just a reasonable amount yeah. of protein. And it doesn't just mean meat. There's so many sources of protein, right? I would suggest not getting processed sources as much as possible. Um, but you need amino acids, not only for that repair of your tissue, but you also need it for your hormone and enzyme function, your immune system function, your brain function, your cognitive function and your mood. So there's, and what happens is if your body doesn't have the amino acids it needs to draw, to do all of those things from your last meal, for instance, it's going to break down your muscle tissue to access the stored aminos in your muscle tissue. And this is why you're losing your muscle faster is because you're not eating enough protein to meet your needs from a baseline perspective, and then you're training too much on top of this. And so your body's just breaking down muscle all the time. And then you're stressed out, cortisol's high, yes. you're breaking down more, you're storing more body fat. So all of these sort of compounding things come together for us starting in perimenopause and get worse postmenopausal if we're not paying attention to these basics, right? So it's really, a lot of it's like, come back to basics, like eat a whole food based diet, like pay attention to what you're taking in, eat just a little more protein and walk more. Like these are all things that your grandmother told you to do. Like you knew to do them when you were younger, but you were too busy and your body was responding to whatever you were doing because it just had a little bit more resilience. Now's the time that you kind of got to do this if you want to have the response in your body. And it only becomes more important for us postmenopausally. Super helpful. Um, this is a quick fire, but what about fasting women? Yeah, yay or nay? Depends. No. I wouldn't, I mean, I'd, I'd say that if you are doing it, I mean, we naturally fast overnight, like stop yes. eating after dinner. Don't eat late at night. Like stop snacking on the couch, you know, get on your walking pad and walk 
and the, yeah. you know when you're watching a show instead of eating a bunch of snacks um if you are i think that's that's a very natural fast that pretty much all of us are doing so i'm not opposed to fasting the only time i would say don't fast is around your your training your body needs those nutrients so that you can have power and output in your workout we got to stop looking at calories out calories in i get like and, and more more yes it's true the less if you eat less calories than you're consuming you'll lose weight but you also are like you can't you can't equate the calories your your treadmill told you you burned with the number of calories you went right. over your diet that just it doesn't work like that in your body so that's kind of what I mean about the calorie thing. Um, but, and I, and I, I just say like the natural fasting state is good because we know that it's, it's helpful to have a, a rich, a protein, a meal with protein in the morning is a really important thing. It can help you get like lower your cortisol, bring you into like a, a state of energy for the day and set you up with a baseline. And a lot of women are doing all this fasted training first thing in the morning. And like, if that's you and you're only like, your only time that you can train is first thing in the morning and you aren't hungry before that. It's okay. Just have a meal afterwards and maybe consider having something like my, um, you know, essential amino formula that has a BCAs in it while you're training mm -hmm. and maybe put some creatine in there and some collagen for good measure because you can. And that's the kind of thing that I would recommend you do just to give your body a little boost of those essential aminos that you need and then have your meal post-workout. If, if you have to, but you're not getting benefits from fasted training. It's actually not the best thing. So that's all I'm trying to say, Dr. Jill, is I know that you, you help your customer, you help people do fasting, right? I just don't recommend, like it's got, it's this huge health craze and, and men get tremendous benefits from fasting that women do not yes. get the same ben benefits from. So I just want to say that for the record, because that's important to know, you know, all the marketing around fasting that you've heard is based on studies mostly done on men or sedentary people, not specifically done on athletic women whose goal is to shift their body composition, right? Like you, you, yeah, you'll lose weight. If you eat less, you will lose weight, but you'll also lose a lot of your muscle. Yes. And do, is that what you want as a, as a woman who's aging in a healthy way? Probably not. But if you just want to lose a lot of weight, sure. Stop eating as much, you know, or whatever. Ozempic. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. For the record, I agree with you. I love that you said that. And I actually rarely have women fasting unless it's a very specific diabetic situation where we're trying to shift metabolically or um, in some Alzheimer's patients, we do more ketogenic diets. So this is very, I just want to say for the record, I agree with you. I think that um, it's very important to, especially post-workout. And I love that you mentioned aminos and creatine. I think these are powerful ways. There's studies that show decreased sarcopenia, which mm -hmm. is the muscle loss. I've been doing it for 20 years. So I've been doing it yep. forever. You know. my, yeah. My pink drink every morning is literally the creatine, the aminos and brain mag. And it's, um, it's so powerful. So I love that you mentioned that. Um, yeah. So people are, I'm sure really interested in what you have to offer in this perimental fit. Tell people where can they find you? Where can they hear more about you? And oh, uh, thanks, Jill. Them, you're welcome. You guys can listen to my podcasts, but you can just go to thebettyrocker.com and find access to all of my programs and things that I offer. And there's a lot of free content and the podcast is free as well. Dr. Jill's been a guest multiple times. She's a very popular guest. We love having her on. So if you want to hear more conversations with her and I, um, that's a great, great resource. And just, just, I just want you to get a feel for the kind of teaching and content that I offer. So there's a lot of free resources on the bettyrocker.com website, especially the women's health section. And there are free workouts, there's free recipes, there's all of that type of stuff for you to access. You can check out my supplement collection if you want to, but you're, you're like, no pressure. You gotta, I gotta feel like the right coach for you. So before you invest in a program with me, I, I think it's a good idea to check out my free resources and, and please feel free to, to do that and to send us a message. Me and the team would love to help you anytime if you have a specific question. Um, but before you, you write us, I would read the guide that I've got extensive guides that are free for women in postmenopause with all of my best tips all laid out. You can just go through that and you can start to apply some of that to yourself. Same thing for perimenopause. Same thing if you're in your cycling years. Um, I, I just I just want women to have access to information. It's not all behind a paywall. You know, like times are tight right now. And and my programs are affordable and, and well-priced and they're very fair and they're going to give you what you need. So feel free to use them and, and buy them if they look interesting to you. But I just want you to have plenty of access to the free resources as well. And that's all available on the bettyrocker.com website.
Thank you, Brie, as always. I was just going to say, we must have good synergy because I've had you on my podcast. I think this is our third episode and some of the highest watched and viewed podcast episodes on my site as well are you and me. So this is awesome. Um, And thank you for the work that you do and continuing to just go that next level, like this new program. I'm so excited. Thank uh, you. Because women need it and women are hungry for this information. So thank you again. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And it's always such a treat to get to connect with your listeners and also with you. So nice to see you. You too.